Welcome to my talk about automated testing and continuous integration delivery lessons learned. A quick introduction, I joined Toradex in 2011. I spearheaded the embedded Linux adoption there. We introduced an upstream first policy and we are amongst the top 10 contributors in U-Boot and the Linux kernel like uh, Tim confirmed again. We also have an industrial embedded Linux uh, platform. It's called Torizon. Uh, it's all based on mainline uh, technology. What will we cover today? We'll quickly have a look what the goal is of any such uh, AD, CI, CD stuff. Then we look at the landscape we have uh, nowadays at Toradex in that area. And uh, of course, we look at the lessons learned, and then I will do an open di open discussion. So I'm also interested to learn what what you guys' experience is. Okay, let's have a look. So, what is the goal of this whole automated testing, uh, CI/CD stuff? So. When we set out, like three years ago, to improve on that, uh, our goal was to deliver more often and better tested software. And of course, also in that process, catching any regressions. And when the automated testing is concerned, of course, any kind of manual testing is very cumbersome and uh, also another thing was, as we upstream first, we wanted to make sure that kind of the quality of the patches we send upstream on the mailing lists, you know, is halfway there that, uh, you know, you don't annoy all the maintainers all the time, not. And such things can really be uh, easy done with some such infrastructure. Let's have a look how that uh, infrastructure landscape looks like for uh, source code management, SCM. We actually use GitLab. As a build infrastructure, we use Jenkins, also pretty standard stuff. Then for the whole DevOps artifacts, binary storage, we actually use the JFrogs artifactory. And then for the automated testing stuff, we, we have a lava board farm. Of course, that infrastructure is not on its own. You can also link that to further infrastructure, as, as this picture here shows. For example, if you use stuff like Slack, you can further integrate that so you get nice uh, notifications whether you hold builds and tests and stuff all this kind of working or not so in the morning where you come in uh, the team already knows what to look at and where to to concentrate on so we have further infrastructure we use the whole atlassian stuff confluence jira then of course we also have some integration so you get some emails automatically and, and like shown here the Slack integration. So far we actually run this, this whole infrastructure on premise. Uh, one reason is for example the whole board farm stuff it will anyway uh, require some local attention monitoring you you know it's also extended we have new SKUs all the time you have to really maintain that. Another reason is also when you're running hundreds of uh, Yocta project builds like we do every night, it, it actually, uh, yeah, it, it is not for free if you run that in a commercial cloud. So you can as well just buy a bunch of servers in your data center, in your own server rooms and, and do that there. Another reason is also you basically lose the whole knowledge about uh, maintaining such infrastructure if you run it in the cloud. And, and that's as at least us, where we're actually a hardware vendor. You basically, you will need some of that knowledge uh, because you want to maintain that on, uh, you know, your hardware, you anyway have to maintain it yourself. 
So for GitLab, it's uh, one of the yeah, widely used uh, SCMs nowadays. So any source code and configuration change that uh, will require a merge request. And uh, such merge requests, you, we have a review process. So it at least needs a reviewer and approver. And one thing we did with our upstream first uh, approach, we also do an internal pre-approval process, like I mentioned earlier. That way you can easily run like check, patch, and all this stuff automatically on it. And also uh, your whole team knows who is working on what and can look and give feedback on those patches before we even send them to the mailing list. Then, of course, the GitLab CI stuff, it can catch regressions. Nowadays, most upstream projects already do have some form of automated <laughs> testing or CI-CD stuff available. For example, U-Boot is also using GitLab, so they, they even provide you all that. One thing that uh, you have to be careful, uh, we have to cope with various uh, branches, versions of stuff, and then it might get tricky you know, to have kind of a one uh, CI thing that would uh, work for uh, for everything. You you probably have to integrate and, and quite, you know, put some integration effort, different tooling, maybe different uh, tool chain versions required depending on what downstream versions of stuff you might also still have in there or not. Then I have some uh, screenshots here, but I, I, my plan is actually if the VPN holds out to, to show you live here. This is, for example, uh, I'm, not, I'm here logged in over the VPN. This is showing our GitLab instance from, from my team. And for example, I can show you here, uh, like I said, for the upstreaming stuff, we have like an X project that basically synchronizes uh, the latest upstream master stuff all the time. And uh, in here, currently there is no merge request open, but in the history of the merge requests, you basically see all the stuff we, we submit. For example, uh, for the latest module, the Texas instrument based one, I worked here on the initial support. So there is a, you can find a merge request and we usually, when, it, when, when we then submit it, we also link it to the, so you actually see where, where it went on the mailing list. So it's also, one advantage is it's now all nicely documented what we did at what point. And one idea is that we would also maybe make more of that information at one point even available for the public so the customers could see what we're kind of working on. Not. Then to do actual builds, I mean, of course, in, in uh, GitLab you can also build stuff, but, but we don't build entire uh, Yocto project images from within GitLab. We do that with a Jenkins build infrastructure, and it basically builds from source code to the artifacts, which then also triggers automated tests <coughs> on, on those builds. Again, I have here some uh, screenshots, but we can ch check here also locked in our VPN that this is our Jenkins instance. You can see here we have different projects. I'm, right now I'm showing the, the Toradex reference image, which is basically the, the, the lower layer BSB Octo project stuff. We, of course, have various branches, and for example, we can here Look at the master stuff. This is like cutting edge master branch uh, Yocto stuff. If I click here, you can see <coughs> there I actually schedule, um, run one while at the conference. I logged in at one point and, and run one. Usually we run the master stuff once a week while the, while the kind of the stable branches we run every night. So I can click here on the concrete uh, instance and you can basically see all the targets we have and all the builds that have been run. And then uh, we, we will see later. Let's see. 
like I said, the, the whole um, artifacts, they are then stored in the artifactory. This is uh, mainly very useful uh, as we also do now this uh, industrial embedded Linux distribution. Of course, that uh, has uh, automated uh, ODR updates, all this kind of stuff integrated, and that pulls all the things from Artifactory. Uh, it, of course, can also handle stuff like uh, S-bombs, and, and, and also we store all the test reports, all this kind of stuff in there, so you have this all nicely together. Again, here uh, some screenshots. So when I basically here now live again, when I uh, click here, for example, test reports, so you get nicely, this is all uh, pulled together and stored in the artifactory. And it's also linked, so you can actually further click. So here you can, for example, see on a, uh, on the Quad X Plus, there was some issue with audio. Let me see. We, we get to that now. So for the for the actual testing, we have a Lava automated testing board farm. It's basically we organize those in in shelves, as we have different uh, families of SOMs. We basically have on on one shelf then a whole bunch of from the same family uh, carrier boards. And such a shelf is then uh, controlled by so-called shelf controller. Right now it is still a Cypress USB microcontroller, which takes care of like power recovery mode and reset signal and all, all this kind of stuff. It also integrates a USB hub and or uh, even FTDI USB to serial adapters. Then we have usually an Ethernet switch on there. And like I said, the carrier boards. And uh, the goal of this design was basically that uh, one such shelf only has one Ethernet cable and one power cable and one USB cable, and, and otherwise is self-contained. And we also use the same infrastructure for uh, validation and verification purpose in, in like temperature chamber. So as a, as a hardware provider, we of course want to make sure that our stuff also runs across the whole rated temperatures. And then. The, the power supply, of course, you need, and uh, the, there is a lot of accompanying uh, infrastructure for testing. So every hardware interface that you want to test, you of course you need some some kind of a, either a device loopback or, or, or something that you can actually test against. And uh, in our lava farm, uh, we basically have the goal that we start off in recovery mode. So we really start from scratch. There is nothing on, on the modules. And then we really flash the entire Octo project image and uh, make it that way that it really boots to basically the real life as close as possible not. Again, here a screenshot. But I, I can, if I now click here, for example, where we left off you basically get uh, get to the, the Lava instance and it shows you exactly, for example, what, what went wrong here. So you can see that, that this, uh, this audio test uh, got a, had, a, had some kind of a problem. And, and if you hear uh, scrolling this, so the whole test that it runs, basically you can see that it, it starts, uh, if you start from the top, it actually starts with uh, even flashing the stuff. It, it creates, of course, the whole uh, lava overlay things. And uh, then eventually, here it does the, the, re the recovery. Let's see. Uh, basically, here you see that, that, that the UUU stuff And then eventually it will will actually have the, the regular boot. So you see that there is a lot of uh, setup basically also involved uh, in, in this. So let's see. 
here I have some uh, impressions also from that port farm. Here there the, is one such shelf shown. This particular one is uh, with all the heat sinks and stuff. These are uh, basically XORA carrier boards with the Apalis modules in them. This is shown uh, the top view of that. On the left upper corner you can see that shelf controller which uh, currently, actually we are in the process of redesigning that, like I said, currently this is still very kind of low level with some Cypress old school uh, USB microcontroller. The new one, we, we will use some STM32, which, which will also feature Ethernet. Of course, that whole USB stuff is a little bit the limitation in, in this case here. And then it, it also integrates some USB hub, like I said, the goal was that we only have like one uh, USB cable per shelf. And then the other cables you see, they, they actually do the whole uh, power on off, uh, recovery mode, all this kind of stuff, reset. Here it's a close up of one of these uh, XORA modules, you see it's quite uh, tightly all the cables that go to it. So, for example, on the left here is the UARTs, the, the upper left is the UART for the console, that will go to an FTDI. The second UART uh, that below that, that basically has a loopback, so you can do loopback testing. And then we have further interfaces, signals, pins here that, that connect. So, for example, uh, actually up here, yeah, we have Audio, you can just loop uh, input to output, not, I mean, kind of line out or something like that, back to microphone or line in. On, on USB, you can just have some, some USB storage device, the same SD card, which is plug in an SD card. On the HDMI, we actually have one of these fake edit dongles, so, so actually it even brings up the whole graphics stack. And uh, yeah, here on the right side, uh, there is another connector with various signals, which we loop back, for example, SBI. We, we have some stuff on I2C, all this kind of stuff. This is the, the whole power supplies. Of course, you need uh, quite some couple of kilowatts of power supplies to yeah, we have now close to a hundred SKUs basically in there, so a hundred modules uh, that get tested in every round. That is basically what's shown here, all these uh, various shelves. Okay, lessons learned. So we are now doing this quite intensely since two, three years. So one thing is, so 99% of reliability is not really enough. So the whole processes and infrastructure must be reliable. Uh, you will always have some kind of sporadic issues on some devices. The problem is if you now scale that up and you have really like 100 devices running, uh, yeah, that basically such failures will also uh, scale up. And then the if you have problems with, with your stuff, the, the stakeholders uh, will lose trust in this whole uh, infrastructure. And then one thing to go about that is that the whole infrastructure, at least it needs to be very re resilient. That means uh, even if some hardware issues remain, I mean, you, like I said, you will always have some issues. I mean, even an SD card, eventually they start failing, you will have to replace them and so forth. You will always have stuff. But the uh, overall test infrastructure, that really needs to be resilient. So it basically copes with such single failures. It, it can't be that then the whole test would abort or something, you just have to overcome it and it has to continue as much as, as possible. Then another thing that we saw is of course that we now massively scaled that this is not totally linear. So the more ports you will have, the, 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 there will be different issues that you, you will see. 
and that, that starts, for example, if you have on your table a single device, it is very easy, you can flash it, no problem. But if you now have a hundred connected to a server, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, USB is nice, you just take a bunch of hops and stuff and hook it all up, but you will see that eventually the, 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 the USB stack, for example, might go bad. We, had that, we saw that, that just every once a week, it just kind of that server's USB stack just kind of crashed, and, and then, yeah, all your tests will, will not really work. Not. And there you have to put a lot of effort to basically investigate and make sure that, that it basically recovers. One thing we did there is you, you have this kind of health step, not? So you have to make sure that in, in, in such a health step, you, for example, reset the whole USB stack, things like that, that you really recover from any kind of uh, situation that can arise. And of course, that at the end, you only find that out with, with real world issues that you see. So do you will have to put a lot of effort and time to, to actually investigate every such issue and, and fix those. Not. <coughs> then a very important thing is that you manage this whole infrastructure just as, as you manage code. So every device you add to the fleet, everything really needs to be nicely a process. And the other advantage is then if you do it like that, you, you also basically even document your whole setup by design basically. So you can just go in there, you see, oh, on that day we added this device, it's all nicely just uh, documented. Not. We also use, for example, Ansible to set up the whole infrastructure to manage it. So you have to make sure that basically it's very reproducible even the setup of this whole infrastructure. And then of course it's also about people just like anything else. So th that is a lot of teamwork basically. You need different people with different skill sets that, that work on such an infrastructure. And you, you cannot just kind of blindly outsource that to somebody. You really have to work together. And uh, one key thing was that the software and the infrastructure teams, they really had to work closely together and, and kind of collaborate very tightly and only then we got to a, to a very much further kind of step where, where the whole uh, reliability and everything improved dramatically not. If you kind of, uh, you know, when you just ping pong that between teams and stuff, then, then you, you likely will never succeed. Not. You will, we will really have to work together and just, just really do the stuff. And then, of course, such test infrastructure, it's, it's basically, it's not just a project, it's, it's a, the entire process, it's kind of an organic system. And, and you cannot just set it and forget it, you will have to constantly work on it, basically. You have to maintain it, you know, versions of stuff changes, you will have to adjust your tests because maybe upstream even something changes. It, I mean, that happens, of course. Theoretically, ABI never changes, but that's not quite how it works. Not So we will have to constantly maintain it. And yeah, it, it needs love over time, basically. That's basically it, and I would uh, also actually want to open, I'm also interested to hear feedback from the audience about uh, kind of similar setups. What is your experience? What are your lessons learned? Things like that. Anybody? Maybe you will start with one question from the stream. Sure, yeah. Um, the question is, why are there two build systems, GitLab and Jenkins? Is, there, is that historical or is there some technical reason for that? I think it's actually a little bit of both. We had a Jenkins build infrastructure even, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, where we still used just like regular uh, C Git or something like that. So we didn't really have any of these modern SCMs in that sense. 
Another reason, I guess, is that, uh, yeah, of course, one could do also full uh, Yocto project builds uh, even in, in GitLab CI, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's not, I mean, Jenkins is just really nicely suited to do such stuff. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are some. It's up here. And uh, hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, would like to know what's your approach regarding caching on the CI, for example, Yocto caches? Yeah, I mean, we do uh, like SA caching that we definitely do. And we also do some kind of priming. So if you run, uh, I mean, you saw the, the whole landscape we have, not, uh, I mean, we have so many, uh, let's see. If you, if you run for a massive amount of, uh, um, a massive amount of different targets, <coughs> one thing that you will see if you would just, uh, even if you have a, a huge cluster and you start now building for all of them, they basically will all build the same thing, which is, doesn't make much sense. So we also uh, prime it, so you start building just for like one 32-bit architecture and for one 64-bit architecture. And that will then put all the stuff in S-state. And then, only then, you start much more parallel to build further things. I mean, that is also things that you find out uh, over time. Basically, you know, you can put twice as many servers and, and start building everything together, but it will actually not be faster. You, if you do it a little bit intelligently, like I said, you prime some builds, you will actually be five times faster, so it, it, even not, not having double the servers, not. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just the regular SDA cache stuff in, in the Octo project. Yeah, I, I'm not fully sure, to be honest, <laughs> on that detail. But uh, I think it's regular SDA cache stuff. Yes? Uh, um, <clears throat> thank you for your talk. Uh, what, can, can you give us a rough estimate on how much coding to testing you are doing right now? Like, you seem to have a very mature testing suite. Mm -hmm. um, and if I would like to to bring that to my company, like how much resources? Yeah, yeah exactly, I know what you mean. I mean, yeah, it, it definitely needs a, a serious amount of resources, basically money, not? I mean, we had at times uh, like three, four people more or less full-time working on this infrastructure stuff. So, I mean, Toradex nowadays has, of course, lots of people, but uh, <laughs> that, they're not all uh, R&D people. I mean, if, like, on the software side, we, we have maybe 20 people and in different teams. And then, but now you need maybe three, four people that will, will have to start working on such infrastructure. Otherwise, you will ne never get to, to such a state, not? Um, so I have two questions. Yes. Uh, in case there is like a bug detected in your CI infrastructure, do you mm -hmm. also report it to upstream in case it affects upstream? Yes, of course. I mean, nowadays, uh, with these master builds here, we, we, uh, it can happen that a uh, new RC comes out and basically the next night, uh, or even that night, we already have that tested. And that way, we sometimes uh, found stuff even quicker than the Linaro guys. So we had, for example, some SPI box that showed up on our form in the morning when we came. We were, we haven't seen this thing quite yet. And then you look into it and you send it to the mailing list, of course. Nice. Uh, I have one more question mm -hmm. uh, about the estate cache. Yeah. Um, do you have a per server estate cache or do you share it between the I different think we, we, we share it between runners? one entire build. Yeah, but the build can run on multiple servers, right? Yeah, I think we have some s shared storage. Okay, uh, got it. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, do you have any experience uh, with uh, simulating hardware interactions? For example, if you need to test the scenario of plugging or unplugging a USB stick into the device under test, mm -hmm. do you do that? And how do you do that if, if you do? No, this is actually one uh, of the further things that uh, we want to have a look at. Uh, this is definitely, I mean, we test USB, but, but more or less in a static fashion right now. And uh, this whole, uh, I mean, you maybe also saw my USB talk. I'm a big fan of this role switching stuff, not <laughs> and it would be very interesting to also uh, automatically test such things. But that uh, requires more hardware, and that is also one reason we are now working on a, on a next generation shelf controller, which will allow much more uh, such advanced uh, use cases. Hello, thanks for your talk, first of all. And do you say that you boot the system in recovery to refresh the whole system? Mm -hmm. And this is, for me, is correct for when you did test the distribution. Um, but you also have OTA. And so uh, do you have any clue on how to test them? That's actually a, a good point, and I don't think we do any special uh, kind of automated testing right now. So you would mean that, that you have a certain state and then would, would kind of incrementally update just like the customer will also update. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know that, that our, uh, I mean, I'm from the, like, the, the low level BSB team and I think our Torizon team, they do some level of that as far as I know. I mean, one thing they for sure do is, for example, this whole uh, container deployment stuff, because the, in, in Torizon you have the whole application layer stuff in containers. And so you basically start off with a minimal image that is actually also a Yocto project built. And then you also deploy further things. But I'm not fully sure. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether Drew would know whether we do any OTA kind of automated testing yet. Yeah, I think they're really working on that, exactly. But it, it's a good point, of course. I mean, the goal is that you, if you really have a product that, that is at customers, of course, you want to test as close to the real life kind of uh, use cases as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, first I'd like to say how Yocto Upstream is using a state cache. Um, we have Michael Halstead actually who knows <laughs> better about it than me, so ask him for details, but it's a shared NFS uh, server which every build machine reads and writes to. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's completely shared between all the builds and mm -hmm. it's yeah. kind of continuously, continuously growing. And that's what everybody in the room should set up their Yocto mm -hmm. builds to really get the most out of the cache. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is actually, uh, I'd like to pick on Jenkins just a little bit more. <laughs> if you were s building this kind of setup today, would you still choose uh, Jenkins or would you choose something else? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I'm also open to hear some <coughs> other approaches, maybe that, that kind of a state-of-the-art approach would maybe be different, yes. I mean, what would your suggestion be, for example? I don't know. I just know that <laughs> Jenkins does not spark joy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and well, uh, but still everybody is using it, not? I mean, Because uh, I they agree. set it up 20 years ago and yeah, they're yeah. stuck. That's the only reason. <laughs> Maybe but there should be some uh, next generation project that, that would do some kind of more modern approach. I, I agree, well, but I I'm not aware that, that there is something. Not. I can only say that Yocto upstream is using BuildBot. Uh, but okay, I don't okay, know yeah, if yeah. it would scale to a real product organization. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you said that you were re uh, reinitializing the boards on every test. Um, so mm -hmm. I was wondering how you do that with Lava, because I was under the impression that it's mainly focused on uploading Linux and the root file system. Yes, we basically had to add our own uh, kind of uh, wrapper for that there. That is true. I mean, the classical Lava approach is, is, is not like that. Not. 
uh, I believe it's it's regular stuff. Yeah. Um, I would just like to point out that we are actually using the GitLab CI for building open embedded okay, images. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess one could definitely do it. Yeah. It is definitely possible, and mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any significant limitations with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, like I said, it was somewhat historic. Not that that we we had this Jenkins stuff already when we when we then introduced the uh, GitLab. So we just left that whole Yocto building stuff. I mean, it it's working fine. We already went through that pain basically that you, you said. But once it's running, I mean, basically, don't touch a running system. Not. I mean, yeah, you have to maintain it, but on the other hand, <laughs> yeah. Question at the front here? Yeah, well. No? Now it's really boring because, we, well, I use GitLab CI for mm -hmm. Yocto builds as well. There's absolutely no reason not to do that. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, uh, I think we, we anyway, uh, yeah. Go yeah, on. thanks for the talk. I would just continue at, with GitHub CI. I, as a single person company without employees, um, just mm -hmm. use GitLab CI connected mm -hmm. to my own Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. And then I use a virtual network to my development boards. Mm -hmm. And with a network controlled uh, power supplies, I can even power them on and power them off automatically. And I've mm -hmm. got really good experience with that. Very good, yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you very much.